Welcome to another episode of Israel Tech. I'm excited to have here in their offices, stage one, managing partner, Tal, ready? Slobodkin. Did I there get it go. right? There, there you go. go. There you go. All right. There's thank a silent so D in there that's actually not silent. It's just misleading. <laughs> Tal, thank you so much for having us at your office. My big, my big pleasure to have you guys here. Thank awesome. You. So tell us about stage one. I'm very familiar with you guys. Uh, I've had the pleasure of serving a bunch of your clients, but yeah. you have never met before. Yeah, should I uh, should I start stage one myself, whatever you prefer? Uh, why don't you tell us a little about kind of stage one, how it came to be, and how you kind of played a part bringing stage one to where it is now? For sure. So, so uh, actually, I think people don't know, but stage one started very, very early on. We uh, the firm was started in two thousand and one. Uh. So back in uh, the the very uh, high days of the Israeli tech, the first bubble, or maybe the, the burst the of the first bubble, and uh, it was founded by Yuval Cohen uh, and, and another partner. Uh, with a very specific purpose to help very, very young companies in the space of basically enterprise tech to grow and become uh, market leaders in what they do. Um, he started also, uh, actually with a lab as well. So it was a uh, part of the Israeli national labs back then, incubation labs. But then uh, through the years that I was sold and the firm started, I joined the firm in 2012 when we were starting to think about the new fund uh, that we eventually launched in 2014. Were you brought in specifically for that fund? Was Great there... story. Uh, so I, uh, I knew Stage One for a long time. Uh, I, I used to work for Cisco in the M and A team, and I ran the investments and acquisitions here in Israel. And um, we had two co-investors with Stage One, uh, both of them actually with my partner today, Yuval. And um, we we get we got along really well together. Uh, he worked us uh, worked well. We had a company that we uh, we sold together, and we were pretty uh, pretty active in setting the course of the company. And then, and then a few months after, Yuval came back to me and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about starting a new fund. Why don't we team up on, uh, on raising the new fund? And um, it, was, it was such a golden opportunity. I had to grab it with both hands and uh, jump to deep water, leave the corporate behind and uh, go start something of my own. So we, we, we basically launched uh, our uh, fundraising effort in 2013 and, uh, and, and uh, basically uh, started the first fund together, stage one, two in 2014. Stage one, two. Yeah. It's, uh, it's <laughs> is tricky. there a stage one, three? There's actually stage three, four? and there's four, and there's now a stage one, four annex as well. Uh, so we keep this complicated. Awesome. Yeah, well, yeah. Why not? So well, let's break it down. How do you exactly go? What was the transition like first from corporate to VC? Did yeah. You, was it what you expected? What were you thinking it was going to be? It's, a, it's, actually, um, it's actually a great question because uh, I've been in corporate for six years at that point. I uh, worked for Cisco two years in the Bay Area. And then, and then I was offered to come back here to Israel and run Israel for them. And they, they opened the office with you? No, the office was actually here. And the guy that was running the office wanted to transition uh, to move to something else. And they said, hey, Tal, you're an Israeli. We have an open space here in Israel to run Israel. Why don't you come over? And um, he, uh, frankly, it was a little too early for us as a family. We wanted to stay a little longer in the U.S. But it was such a great opportunity to, A, go back to Israel. And, and we love Israel and we love being here. And, uh, and B, career-wise, it was just a great jump for me. So uh, I, we moved back here. I remember it was February 2010. I still had, had a bunch of deals uh, that I still worked on on, on the U.S. Um, and I started doing this. And I did this all in, give or take, for three and a half years until we physically launched stage one. Uh, but uh, but it, was, it, was a great, it was a great period here. Um, but you asked about the transition. I think, I think the key over there is... Um, you know, maybe the trigger for me to move on was to say uh, two things. Hey, I wanted to do, I wanted to be in a decision making uh, position. So uh, it, it was great to be the only Israeli running the investments here, but still, uh, it's it's a public company. You have an investment committee. You have a big group making the decision, and you have tons of red tape you see in large corporates. And uh, and I wanted to see, hey, this is a great company. I want to do this investment. And B, yeah, I mean. I, I, I've never been an entrepreneur before. And for me, that was a chance to basically start something of my own and be able to say, that's my thing. I'm going to build this from scratch. And um, you know, fast forward, uh, give or take 10 years. It's been, a, it's been a really fun ride. Awesome. So let's talk about like starting your first fund, right? Yeah. Or the, and you came in for stage one, two. Yes. Um, this number is so hard to remember. Um, Here you go. Yeah, yeah. So what was it like to... How are you able to leverage your skills and your experience in order to help raise money? It's like a whole nother thing, corporate, and now you're yeah, suddenly you're, um, you're a macher, you know, going this, around. It's actually it. true. I, uh, I many times I joke with my um, I joke with my founders, uh, the CEO of the companies that 
you guys go out fundraising, you meet, uh, you meet 50 VCs, 100 VC, you need one of them to invest. We meet like 100 LPs, we need all of them to invest. That's, that's a very different ball game. Um, so, so maybe maybe going a little back uh, in my background. So before, before being at Cisco, I was actually uh, working for a short time at Goldman in their investment banking team in New York. And I got there through my time at Wharton. I did my MBA at Wharton. Uh -huh. and, um, and I think, I, at least for me, the biggest transition was from being uh, an officer in the Israeli army to go and, uh, and to do a Wharton MBA, which is really 180 degrees from, from what you used to in the army, where there's like a non-bullshit, very direct, let's get stuff done, to, again, for me, the first real American experience of... Uh, you need to, you know, work around what you're trying to achieve. You need to be able to do storytelling. You need to be able to uh, to, to get to your goals and mission slowly but uh, surely. And uh, so the transition was actually started there when I moved to the U.S. Uh, well, say like the MBAs like to say, I like to hone my I, I hone my uh, presentation skills over there. And I think um, and I think those years in the U.S. and those years in the corporate really helped me understand how investors look at. Uh, look at GPs and funds and companies and what they are looking for when I'm talking to them and trying to pitch stage one. Um, I think it worked well. Uh, overall, I mean, we were able to raise fund two and then fund three and then fund four. Um, but it's um, people don't realize that. But it's a, it's a big, it's a it's a very long and and um, and hard uh, uh, roller coaster of raising a fund. Because it's typically significantly longer than a company raising money. It's not the maybe three, six months, it's usually a year. It's a process that with most investors, you need to start way ahead because these people want to know you from your existing fund, your previous fund. You need you need to network, you need to get you need to build a sense of trust. Yeah. I mean I mean the LPs told us most of the investment we've done, these are people that we knew for five, six, seven. How do you years. how do you build that trust? Yeah, we, um, we, we spend a lot Because of what was it like? You start a VC and like, well, no one's going to trust us, so we're not going to have a fund for another five, six years. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually, a, a, many people do that, but, uh, but most people try to leverage, uh, leverage their background. So we were in a position where Yuval had a successful, a very successful track record in stage one one. And he had a brand that was existing and we had a bunch of LPs from the first fund. And, um, and I had the track record of Cisco and the investment I've done over there. And the ability to you know, work in the U.S., live in the U.S., start companies, help companies, sell companies over there, buy companies here. And we, we had to weave a good story of how first these two stories combine and how each of our individual backgrounds help. And then lastly, but even more important, how do we have, uh, or what is our shared strategy to go and build this together and make an investment thesis that really makes sense to those LPs? Because uh, you're right. They need to trust me and they need to know me, but they also need to believe in the story I'm selling them or on, at the end of the day, why are they going to make great money in this investment? You start a fund, you get, you, so you said there was a thesis around this fund, right? You need a thesis. Yes. What does that mean? Like we're going to go after a certain industry, we think something's hot, or you're going to go after a certain maybe personality. It's like, what are the different kind of theses are involved yeah, when, these are, when these determining are... a fund? And how do you choose which one to move forward on? It's a great set of questions, and um, and what's 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 really great about them is that when you look at the the landscape of Israeli VCs, you get VCs with any one of those approaches. So uh, so we have to pick one, and I think our approach and and it, it, at the end of the day, it's one of the things where you uh, you have a history or you have an experience, and you're building a future thesis, and you got to tie those two together of where I was, what I'm doing now, and what I'm going to do in the future, and it's going to be very hard to say. You know, I've been uh, I've been at Uni eighty one. I've been doing deep tech all my life, and I'm not going to do consumer investments. It just it, we feel it doesn't jive well together. So, our thesis at that point was to say, we think Israeli tech has very strong foundations, and those foundations are really based on a few things: uh, on deep understanding of technology, on great uh, uh, human talent coming out of the army and the universities. And, and a growing culture of how to build companies. And for us, uh, both Stage One and Cisco are just great deep tech investors. We always like to invest in companies where the, 
the, the, the added value or the, the challenge they're facing is deeply technological. And once you invest in this, you're, you're already starting with a big barrier of entry to your competition because you're building something that is hard to build. You spend a lot of time and you put a lot of effort into this. So we knew this is, this is the first piece and we want to do this for enterprise. And the second piece is that we, uh, we think in Israel, the best returns come from very early, early, early on investments. And um, there is always a balance between the risk of those companies failing right. and the great returns because you invest in a very low valuation. Uh -huh. We think that this risk return um, balance is probably the best at the very early stage. And when uh -huh. I say very early, for us, inception stage. Companies are opening up with our money. Uh, so this is the second piece of our strategy. And the third piece of this triangle of strategy was, was Israel. We're obviously big fans of Israel and we think the, the ecosystem here is great. And we also understand that our network and our experience is surrounding Israel. There's no point for me to go and do tech investment in Berlin. Like I don't add any real value over there. But with my network and with my ecosystem and with, my, with Yuval's experience and the people that he knows, we can get to absolutely great entrepreneurs and help them build companies from the get-go facing real enterprise challenges. And that's really the thesis of stage one. Awesome. So when you go and try to raise money for a fund, do you find that you're speaking to those interested in investing? Like, is one of the questions asking is, do they usually think to yourself, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna invest X amount, but they're like, I don't know whether to put in stage one or another VC. Um, and how do you and other VCs try to convince, yeah. or is it not convincing? Is it totally relationships and track record, or kind of what is it like in order to you know yeah. to get someone to de depart with their money to invest it with you? Yeah, and also tied to this, I mean, there, there are investors that you come to them and you need to convince them that's a good idea. And there are investors that you come to them and say, we're looking for a VC specifically in this spot and want to see if you fit. And uh, the landscape of investors or LPs for us, limited partners, is, is wide. It starts with Joe, a wealthy individual who had enough of investing directly in companies and he's now looking to do serious VC investments because that's a portfolio approach for him all the way to um, uh, the, the retirement funds of uh, Texas, where they're managing tens of billions of dollars and they have a very strict approach on different segments and how they invest in them. And, and uh, one of the things you need to do as, a, as, a, as a, somebody who is now raising his own VCs, you need to understand the spectrum and realize what are those spots that you feed the best. So for us, for example, we knew two things. We knew Joe, the private angel investor is probably too small for us and we're not going to start chasing those people and just too hard and complicated for us. We also knew that uh, UTMC or other of the, the very large investors, they're not going to be putting checks in a $75 million fund. So we ended up really narrowing the scope into a set of investors that we thought are A, professional investors, know how to invest in VC and we don't need to do the market education of what is a VC, why do you need to invest in a VC? And B, uh, LPs that are interested in the, the, the geography and the segments and the stage that we invest in. And, um, and luckily we found, we found a bunch of those. Frankly, to be honest, we, we did end up having investment with people that we were the first VC investment for them and we had to do education for them. And we had one or two of the very large LPs that accidentally stumbled upon us and said, that's great, we want to invest in you. But the bulk majority are what you would call institutional investors, institutional LPs that have done many, many investing in general partners in GP so far. Before we continue more in the kind of stage one, I really want to know like how you met your partners and all that. So you're saying obviously one of the major components of stage one is of course you're focusing on investing in Israel. Yeah. Um, now you spend time abroad and you even mentioned, you know, you enjoyed your time abroad while you were there. Um, but what is your backstory like here in Israel? You, were you yeah. born here? Because your accent is is very American. And tell us a little bit about your background sure. in Israel. Yeah, so I, uh, I I'm born and raised in Israel in Haifa, actually. I'm a proud Haifa graduate. Uh, there's always a joke where uh, you, you can meet many people from Haifa, but you never actually get to Haifa because all of them left Haifa at one point or another. So born and raised over there. Uh, um, I was uh, I was lucky enough to be drafted to Talpiot, the military academy uh -huh. uh, of of the, the IDF. Uh, 
really a great program. I'm still super connected to it, and it, uh, it feels to me like it really had a tremendous impact on my life. So uh, three years in the academy, um, undergrad uh, studies over there, math, physics, and computer science. And then uh, one of the biggest benefits you get as part of Tel Pihot is that you actually get to be involved in the selection process of where you go to serve the rest of your service. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I'm, I'm throwing you back to, uh, to 99, where I was, uh, I was uh, making this decision. Uh, early days of the internet, very early days of the internet. I was, uh, I was, uh, I wouldn't say a hacker, but I spent a lot of time with computers uh, growing up, especially in, in high school. And, uh, and this was, uh, this was the convergence of me really liking internet and the early days of that and army starting to build for a cyber presence. And I got a chance to join Unit 81 and basically... Well, what, what is Unit 81? Say again? What is Unit 81? Yeah, so Unit 81 is the, is the elite technology unit of the Intelligence Corps. And it's basically the unit that is in charge of building the real intelligence infrastructure of getting intelligence to Israel. What, is it, what does that mean? I mean, that sounds great, but... Like, it's basically, it's basically a, a very large tech organization uh, in, in the thousands, low thousands, that is building unique, one-time only, special purpose devices that are being built to bring intelligence to Israel. When you say devices, are these physical, the yeah. hardware and software? Yeah, most of the time. Uh -huh. And, uh, and um, the unit is, uh, is, is it's, you know, we're very proud to get the, the most uh, Israel Defense Awards uh, in, in the Israeli army. For what? what? Can you give me an example of some one of the things you've done? I actually cannot. Uh, almost everything that the unit does is highly confidential. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we get awards to each one of those say boxes or devices that we be able to use. Uh -huh. Usually, Here's an award for something we cannot disclose. Yes, we can use the word device. <laughs> yes, I, but, I can give you an award for yes. that too. But I'll, I'll, everybody wants to work on a device. But I'll be, I'll be more specific. If you think about this, uh, uh, any one of those projects, uh, there are thousands of people working for typically a multiple number of years to bring this device or project out. And when you compare this to the scale you see in the civilian life, you hardly have any startup company or any corporate here in Israel that has the same amount of people working the same amount of time on projects. So the scale of the project that we're working on is absolutely incredible. So, but you're saying I mean, these projects take years just for a one-off project. Yeah. Um, are, you, are you or people in Unit 81, do they need to be there for the course of the whole project? Yeah. So like if you're starting a project and turns out it's going to be a five-year project, they won't let you out of the army until the project's completed? Yeah, so, so, uh, so one of the things I really liked about the unit is that most people that get drafted to the unit are A, signing to begin with for a longer duration. So not and, and they don't even years. know how long. No it's, it's, you, no, it's not tied to the project, so people would leave and come within projects, but most of the people, it's like the average age in the unit is like 35, I think. So, oh, okay. So people stay there for a long time. People retire from the unit. That's their whole career. Many yeah, people. for many of them. I mean, I stay there for, for seven years and um, I'm, I'm still super tied to the unit. I like everybody. I feel like if you spend that much time and you're doing something that intently with that many people on such a focused mission, hour in, hour out, Right. Yeah, it's the, it's uh, the, you you must the bonds created there. It, it's absolutely amazing, and and you get a, you get a tremendous sense of accomplishment from what you're bringing to the country. But also, you're right, like from from being there for weeks and weekends and nights and spending you know, years over there, you're building a long uh, you know long lasting relationship that, that are really influential. And you maybe fast forward for a moment and going back there. When I came back from the U.S., um, uh, I teamed up with, with a good friend and we basically relaunched the alumni organization of the unit. And, uh, and I've, been, I've been leading for almost a decade um, and basically gather all those people and find like create a new home for them post-service to you know, hang around socially, uh, do stuff professionally together. And even more important than those two, just give back. Uh, you, get a, you get a group of you know, thousands of super talented people and you want them to be you know, punching above their weight in terms of giving back to the country. And this has been, this has been going really well as part of the alumni organization. But so the, these, you, you work in such close corners, right, in, on these projects. 
How much networking or helping or has that helped your career in the future, those connections? Oh, absolutely. So, so when I take those two experiences, the three years at Telpiot, when it's just, at the end of the day, it's a group of 30 people spending literally day and night because you stay, it's like dorms. So you spend three years with them and then people are branching out and leaving different parts of, of the different units of the army. And then same with Unit 81, you're in the trenches with those people for seven years and you're building something that your whole life is focused on. Uh, you, you get to you get to get best friends. And then uh, when they leave the army and it just happens one day, most of them go and start their own companies and build their own uh, products. And, uh, and this network plays a great, great uh, effect to us. What year, when did you leave? So I was in the army from 96 to 2006. And, uh, and I left to basically, uh, apply for MBA and, uh, and leave out to the U.S. Uh, so what made you decide to say, okay, I had enough here? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. Um, I, I, think, I think at one point where you do multiple projects, you realize that they're, you're eating a, a cross story where you're either going to stay and do this in a sense forever or until retirement, or you want to go and do something else on your own. And, um, and for me, that was uh, at the end of one of those projects age 27, I said, it's probably a good idea to rethink what's my, my path forward. I knew I'm not gonna be a, a major lieutenant, whatever, stay forever in the army. So I said, I might as well just leave now and do something else. I was always super interested in the business world. Um, and I, and I, uh, I knew that this is a big chunk that I'm missing. Uh, I'll give you another example. You work on this project, thousands of people, many, many years, you never ever see a profit and loss statement or an income statement. There is nothing about money because somebody else is managing the money. Somebody else is buying the products. So this is all for free. You just come work on the project and everything is covered. And then you realize, well, life is a little different. Yeah, you have accounting, <laughs> yes. legal, account receivable. Yes, exactly. Employees, exactly. taxes. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, so, we, uh, so I said, I, I want to go to the business world and I figured, I can go and start working on a bunch of different roles in startup companies, or I can go and do uh, and, and do this what I thought properly and go and go to school and learn business and start a new career in business. Uh, so that was a decision uh, to leave the army and go and go to business school. So you went to business school, you went to Wharton? Yes. Awesome. So I'm from Philly, so I'm very familiar with Wharton. Go Phillies. Uh, yeah, so uh, just don't say go Eagles right now. Um, <laughs> the, so what did you feel like you really learned from business school that you're able to apply? And then from there, you went straight to Cisco? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I did the summer with Goldman that I mentioned, and then I worked for Cisco post, uh, post MBA. So, I mean, for me, the MBA really filled for, for things that I was, I was really uh, missing. First, I think academically, um, I, uh, I, I never had the chance to learn anything business. Like, I, as you said, I didn't know what's PL, what's account receivable. And this was such a great, fast course on getting business. And it's also, I mean, with no disrespect to any other, any other schools, but you, you go to an Ivy, Ivy League school, you get to really learn from the best. You get to see the CEOs of no, no, Not anymore, now you get to learn from the worst. It's actually, it's actually <laughs> it's such a big discussion. I can talk about this forever, uh -huh. uh, but we'll leave this aside. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's just a super important way to get the knowledge that I was missing. And I, and I enjoy this a lot. So this is one. Two is, uh, is uh, you get to, uh, you get, basically get to jumpstart your career. So think about this. I was an Israeli coming from the army. I had zero lines in my resume that has any business idea or business resemblance. And then, uh, and then I worked for Goldman, which is you know an okay bulge back at bank in, in Wall Street. And then I went to work for Cisco. And the only reason I got a chance to do those two is because uh, what I learned in, at Wharton and the chance that I got through the recruiting system over there. So, so that was two, getting like the, the on-the-job training or getting the chance to do this. I think the third component of Wharton, which plays a very important role today, is, uh, is just the network that I built over there. Now, people like to talk about the, the, the network. network. The network, the people that we yeah, met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you said network or net worth. That no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> net worth, yeah, not yet. Network is working. Uh, so um, 
I mean, you meet those great people. Uh, my learning team had a, had, a, had a singer and it's somebody from like the California electric system and, uh, and uh, uh, an engineer from India. So very, and a hedge fund manager, so a, a very diverse team. And you get to meet those people and say, oh my God, there are so many different things you can do uh, out there in the world and there are so many opportunities. So this is the first piece of the network. But then the second is fast forward 10, 15 years, your classmates are becoming, you know, senior influential people that you, you, you get to work with and you get to help them and they get to help you and uh, you get to do fun stuff together. And it's, it's, it's really impressive because we've all grown to different places in our career. So how would you compare the network of uh, the army to uh, Ivy League? Yeah, I think, I think it's, just, it's, it's just a very different network. Yeah. Could, think, could you talk uh, about that for a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, I, I think the Army Network is really around the local startup ecosystem here in Israel and the ability to uh, find great ideas and grow them and build them and find engineers and build the teams over here. And, and it's, it's such a great local network. And I mean, obviously, many of them left Israel and they've become you know, seniors in corporates. But still, it's a very, I would say, maybe you're like an R&D focused uh, network. The network of the of of the business school is just very different. A because most people don't do R and D at all over there. Most people do you know, general management, uh, finance roles, product roles, and and B most of these guys just plugged in hubs in the U.S. where mostly Israelis are just not there. So uh, what even, do you mean not there in the hubs in the U.S.? What do you mean? Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, um, let's take concrete examples. Uh, uh, even from the tech industry, let's take Salesforce. So Salesforce has a bunch of Israelis as well. And most of them are typically, maybe aside from Safra Katz, that is very senior. But most of the Israelis over there are either concentrated in the hub here in Israel or have slowly grown into different parts of the industry, but usually around R&D for Salesforce. My US network in Salesforce is really very, very different. I have friends that are running uh, partnerships in Salesforce. This is, again, just an example. I have friends that are running a uh, product in Salesforce, and this is the global Salesforce out there in the US, and it's just a different approach. So it's really great for me to connect with these Israelis here. And for example, when we're trying to sell a company or to connect a the company, they're helping with R&D and how to plug to the engineer organization, which is typically the right way to get my companies involved with the company. But now the network in the US really helped me in a sense, get the executive attention to those companies. And I think both of them are super important. So from Wharton, right, you were over at Cisco. And then tell us about kind of then you said you got you got called in kind of like from a, from a friend, let, let's start a VC, yeah. right? And you came back to stage one. And uh, let's bring it back kind of to stage one and the networking and the app. Actually, sure. the, the managing partner, the teams, how does... How does how does one build a team in a VC? Yeah. What, how do you want to, you know, you, getting a team together isn't necessarily easy. How does that happen? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, so I'll start by saying this is something we spend a lot of time on. And we, we put just a great focus on, on the team here. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, people sometimes forget this, but we, we got money from investors and we need to make great investments and we need to return them more money than they gave us. Right. Obviously, significantly more money. I, I would hope more than just more. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so this is, this is where, why we are here. Uh-huh. Uh, but to, in order to do this, we need to find great investments and help them grow and become successful companies and then be able to exit them. And to do all of this, we need great people to be working with. So going back to where you started, uh, when we were uh, we were rebuilding stage one in 2013, it was Yuval and myself sitting in my uh, living room uh, living room table and you know building the the presentation of what we're going to say to the LPs. And, and fast forward, we're not a huge organization; we're 11 people today. But um, every addition from the two to the 11 was just critical to the way we are built. And for us, uh, we, we had three, we had a few things that are just super important for us when we're looking for people. A, um, and I think that's far most important, is we want to we want to bring people that it's fun and good and friendly and supportive uh, to work with. 
We want to create an environment where people come to work every day smiling and, um, and they know they're doing something important and they enjoy what they do. And sometimes people, people leave this to the end, but this is really top of mind for us. We're, uh, we have in a sense, partners and employees that work with us and we want to make sure they're doing something important in their life and enjoy what they do. Uh, so this is, uh, this is first, it's not the only one obviously, but this is first for us. Two is we, we wanted to build a team that is excellent in, in A, uh, understanding what we're doing, understanding the market that we operate in, understanding the stages that we operate in, but also can really connect to people and bring value and, um, and, and work with them. And I think what, one of the things I'm super proud of is that most of the feedback we get on us, on our, on our employees, on our partners, is that people just want, want to work with us. People enjoy the time, people value. What, what, what makes you enjoyable to work with that let's say other VCs aren't as enjoyable? Or like, what, what do you mean? Like, yeah, I mean, wouldn't I feel like in order to be successful, you need to be enjoyable to work with, period, no? No, so, so it's- For the it's, most part. In a sense, that's the only VC I work for. So it's hard for me to, right. to give you, you know, the opinion on others. I think, I think it's gonna sound silly, but we're reasonable. Uh -huh. We like to talk to the entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs understand what they feel. Well, most don't, people don't do that. I think I think I think there there are many uh, many investors that have their approach of how to do things, and uh, and like to drive this approach forward. Uh, we like to do things a little more collaborative and try to understand uh, what does everybody think uh -huh. and and uh, what is the right thing to do at any point. Not is not necessarily what is the right thing for me to do at any point. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're uh, uh, we're taking decisions that are not necessarily good for us. I think at the end of the day, it is important for us to convey to the entrepreneurs that, listen, sometimes we forget this, but I have a goal here, which is to make money to my investors. Right. Uh, but as long as we're operating in these boundaries, we want to be in a very collaborative approach of how we do this together. You and us building value and collaborating together to make this company great is something that both of us are going to benefit. And it's less about me commanding you or giving you advice in a sense of you need to do this right now. It's more about let's build this together. And, uh, and when you think about this, we make inception stage companies. So most of the companies we invest in are getting their first money ever from us. And these are people that have never raised any money. We have entrepreneurs that are 23, 24 year old. Now, how much do you usually invest in VC? We, we've done Increasing. we've done anything from from uh, from a fifty k, a hundred k to six and a half million, but we are going to be partnering with those people for likely way. for five, six, seven, ten years, uh -huh. and very very quickly because we are the earliest investors and because of the way usually the capital structure work, we're going to be very aligned with them also financially because we're just the, the lowest of the preference stack in a sense. And we are their partners, we're their closest ally. And we want to be the first phone call they make when they have good news and when they have bad news. And, and, and luckily this is what's happening. How often do you speak to your founder? So, so I personally speak to those guys probably a few times a week. Um, it, it could be a quick WhatsApp chat. It could be a one half hour strategy discussion. Um, and again, this is something I'm personally very proud of. Mm -hmm. I have my founders call me on a Saturday night to tell me what's coming up at the week ahead. And, um, and, and I mean, we need to realize or people need to realize that we uh, supporting those companies is typically on the bad times, not the good times. Mm -hmm. On the good times, everybody, everything is great. You know, the company is sailing forward. Everybody's super happy. It's on those tough times when your founders and your CEOs need your help. This is really the moment to shine and to bring yourself to the table. And and in in times like this, you know, early 2024, um, they need this help. There is a there is a you know, global crisis. Um, there are uh, companies that are running short in cash, and you need to help them. And and I think again, outside from being super proud on our very successful companies and exits. We're also very proud that even the company that ended up shutting down, 
are people that will still pick up the phone and call us. Right. And people that will say, you know, we thank Stage One for how they behaved in this mm -hmm. process, even though we ended up not doing that great. Well, well, actually, that's actually interesting. No one talks about that. What is it? What are the decisions like go through right before usually, let's say, when a startup has to shut down and kind of how does the relationship change and adapt? I'm curious how that how that works because it's obviously a very difficult decision yeah. for so many stakeholders, um, yeah. and especially you and the founders in particular as their baby. Yeah. So say the process is uh, like Hemingway said, uh, how we get uh, bankrupt. You know that quote. He said it happened suddenly, uh, yeah, gradually, gradually then suddenly. suddenly. Yeah. So same happens with uh, we startups. It's uh, when things go, unfortunately, uh -huh. not great. It's it's very gradually, uh -huh. and then you get a point where somebody wakes up and says, "Oh my God, we're going to be running out of money in like a month." Wow. Uh -huh. And uh, and obviously, you you've been preparing for this moment, and you've been doing everything you can in the six months before on trying to raise money and trying to um, and try to get the, the company to a better spot and maybe do some you know structuring. But at the end of the day, there is this moment that you say, oh my God, two weeks from now, if nothing happens, if you don't get money, we need to start shutting down. Uh -huh. and, and A, the process is very painful. It's, uh, it's painful because as you said, it's everybody's baby. Uh, it's first and foremost, the founder's baby and the employee's baby, but it's also something we've been spending at that point many, many years on. And the decisions are typically trying to avoid at all costs shutting down the company, which again means A, easiest is to raise money, B, not easy, let go of some people, or shut, you know, reduce burn. But then the board needs to take a decision to shut down the company. Uh -huh. And, and the process is something we spend a lot of time with them on building the right process and making sure first that all employees and everybody that we have any, uh, any responsibility over gets to, gets to be paid. And we're always making sure there is enough money to pay all of them. Then you have various debt holders. And typically, uh, typically what's left goes to the investors, but that's typically zero. Mm -hmm. um, so there are just very, 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 very uh -huh. few, if at all, situations where the investors got any money back. It's typically not happening. So managing partners are often assigned to be board members in different startups. Yeah. How do you how do you decide you being stage one, um, or this or the founders decide who sits on what board? Yeah. Yeah. So we. Um, so today we have five people on the investment team. We have three partners. Uh, Yuval and I manage the firm. We have uh, Nate Meir, who is, uh, who is a partner with us as well. And then we had uh, Nofar and Aviad, who are both principals over here. Um, as part of, as part of uh, your, your previous question about growing the team, uh, we, we really like giving everybody an opportunity to collaborate with companies. And we have our principals also board members in some of those companies. Most of the cases, it's with us. So we will be either observers on the board or just be there with no official capacity. But then for, for the majority of the company, you will be the partners as, as board members. It's, it's either a process where one of the partners brought in the investment and have been working with them very closely. So he's like the designated driver, right. the designated board member. Uh, but we, we've seen a situations in the past where we have to rebalance boards between us. It happens, um, it happens as a decision in, in the, you know, the partnership team. Um, and it's typically you know, discussed and, and ironed out with, with the founding teams as well, just to make sure that they feel comfortable with any transition that happened. Uh -huh. what, what are the biggest resistance that you usually get from uh, founders, um, not just transitioning, but I mean, in general, in the relationship? Where is there often, even though, let's say, you guys may have the same interests, your financial yeah. may be aligned, where is there often the greatest conflict, disagreement, pushback, um, broken communication between founders um, and yeah. the board? It's a good question. I think um, I, I think I think there there are many issues where where there is a, where there, there there could be disagreements. I think a Many times it's around the path of the companies. How do we? How are we going to grow? 
how we're going to build a company, what should we should we do option A or option B, should we go direct to customers, should we go through channels and stuff like that. This is one area where boards spend a lot of time. It's not necessarily disagreement, it's more of like an open, lively discussion and everybody bring their own. Yeah, but where are the disagreements? You know, yes. I'm sure like, I'm curious, where are the uh, So the disagreements on this specific segment will be, hey, you know, I've been doing 20 B2B investments, this approach never works. Like, I know you think you should be selling directly to those people, you cannot sell this. Like we've you'll, seen- You'll just, you'll veto it. No, no, I, I would Can not veto it. it. I would say, my experience shows that this approach will not work. Right. We, I mean, you're the CEO. If you think we should go and give it a chance, let's understand what does it mean giving it a chance? Mm -hmm. How much time do we give this? How much money are we willing to spend on this? And how do we declare success or failure? Right. And we, we typically will say, I mean, he's a CEO, he knows best. Right. So if he is absolutely certain, or she's absolutely certain this is the right approach, we'll give her the chance to do so. But we would like to define specific KPIs on what is a success. And when we, hit, when we don't hit them, what is the other approach we could do? Right. So this is one area. Another area is, is, uh, is where there, there are disagreements on the, I'll say the, the success of different team members or the, the fit of different team members. Ah, interesting. Um, and this is, this, is actually, uh, this is actually not necessarily around the founding team. This is many times, hey, you brought this salesperson, you're giving him too much chance. Like he's been around for six months now. We think it's too much. We think we need to move on. Right. And many times the founders will be a little protective right. on, um, on, on their team members. And again, I've, I've almost never seen a situation where the board has forced CEOs to a decision. It's just... Well, it, it, it's, it's the beginning of an end of a relationship if you do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's, it's really in a very harsh situation. Right. And frankly, it doesn't happen. It's more of a, let me help. Right. Let me help you. I'll, I'll convey my opinion mm -hmm. and help me. I'll try to understand, to help you understand why I think this should be, this should be done. Okay. So see, this is number two, maybe number three. Uh, and this is not necessarily disagreement because there's also cases where we help them is that founding teams, especially when they're three and above, uh, are in, in some percentage likely not to work well together. Are not going to. Yeah. So you, you can ask, what's this percentage? We think it's about 25 to 30%. So uh -huh. three of every 10 companies will have a serious founding team disagreements. What, what, it, what usually comes up in a serious founding team disagreements? What is it around? It's, it's I'll say it's going to be a, a little generic, but it's roles and responsibilities. Got it. Basically. Is it, is it related more to pride or more to? Yeah. So, so we, everything ties back together. But when you think about this, uh, I'm going to give you an extreme example, but still. Many times, these are three people that work together in the army and they got to a room and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this startup. I have this great idea, which is really great. And they're going to say, okay, we need a CEO. Uh, we need a VP R&D. And uh, we need maybe on the marketing sales guy. This is typically what you need when you start a company. But then you have three VP R&Ds because these guys came from the army. This is what they do. Ah, right. So then they, uh, one of them drew the... the the shortest straw, okay, you're gonna be the CEO, okay? <laughs> uh, you're gonna be, you cannot be VP marketing because you don't know marketing. So why don't we do a CTO and a VP R&D? Right. Which is basically the same, just for two people. And then you start working and then, um, this is all fictional, right? Nothing is, uh, uh -huh. is but then <laughs> you would say, the VP R&D says, okay, uh, this is working really great for me, but there's this other guy, CTO, who is, I don't know what's his role, and he has no responsibility on the company. And he is doing basically nothing right now. So what uh, are we going to do now? Uh, this is just an example. Or right. the two, the two, the VP R and D, the CTO would say, the guy that we uh, that took the draw to become the CEO, we just not CEO material. CEO material. Right. And um, and what do we do about this? And many times he will come and say that the CEO will say, you know, I've been trying this for six months and it's not for me. I cannot do this anymore. Right. And and so we we've seen all of those transitions of. People switching roles, including the CEO. Uh -huh. People leaving. Right. People joining. Right. We have people joining as a founder, maybe right. six months after. Right. And yeah, that's common. Yeah, it happens. Right. And we um, we really try to help them facilitate this. Uh, and by saying facilitating, I mean a help them understand what's happening, 
and what's functioning and what's dysfunctioning, and B, help them try to find a solution to the problem. Because uh-huh. you mentioned pride and ego. Uh, this comes in very, very quickly. You, like, very you notice quickly. it right away. Yeah, I mean, I it's mean, easy uh, to notice before you invest, no? Isn't it? No, because right? because uh, everybody's a everybody's a happy camper. We're right. raising money. Everything is great. We have right. this great idea. You don't have much to lose then. Yeah, and then the, um, again, going back to my example, the VPRD still doesn't know he's not a great VPRD. Right. Until he's been running for six months and understanding he's not a great VPRD. Right. Or the CEO is absolutely certain he's going to be the best CEO ever. Right. And and again, it's. Um, I would say even more than that. I think many people go through their personal journey side by side with the company journey. Interesting. And they realize, you know what, maybe I'm not the CEO. Right. Like, I love this company and I, I'm great in A, B, and C. I'm just not good in D, E, and F, which is what I need to be as a good CEO. Right. But Johnny, who started with me, he's really great at that. And we had companies switching founders Switching roles. This guy, CEO, became VPRD. VPRD became CEO, and it's uh-huh. it's working great. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Uh, you, so you're saying three co-founders or more can be a flag? No, it, it's it, no, no. Don't get me wrong. It's almost all the companies we th- we see are three and more in that have company. issues. No, no, it, it, no. I say all the companies we see almost period. Ah, okay. Are three and more. That's the common structure in Israel. Right. So the, that's going to be my next question. And it's 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 not necessarily. I mean, I said twenty five percent happens. It's not a it's not a flag because all the companies you can't avoid it. Yeah, it's it's and it's and it's and it's absolutely fine. Right. We on, on the contrary, we don't like sole founders. That that was my. I was going to ask. Yeah. You, what are your What are your thoughts on sole founders? And let's say, so would you say two? Yeah, two, two co-founders would be ideal, even yeah, though there aren't many to pick from. Yeah, two and three are, are also fine. Uh-huh. And What's I mean, wrong with the solo founder? It, asking for a friend. Asking for <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking for funding or anything. <laughs> no, let me say, I'll, say, I'll say this. I think, uh, and I, uh, I I talk a lot about entrepreneurs, and I, I got a chance to speak in, in some universities as well and give like the, the VC perspective, and I talk about how VC think. And my, la- my last slide in this presentation shows the journey of a startup uh-huh. and it shows like he has like a flat line what you hope for this is like beginning this is like great success yeah. and then he shows there's a crazy crazy like curvy right. line and goes to success and i tell people everybody read in the newspaper those great stories and everything is great but being a founder excuse my language sucks it's hard it's right. a hard job and unfortunately for you most of the time, things are not going to work well. Right. It's going to be disappointing. Everything sucks. People annoy you. Clients don't buy. Right. People don't sign. Right. Money is running out. You're always in stress. It's hard. Right. And it's far, far harder to do this alone. Mm-hmm. It's almost unbearably hard to do this alone. Uh, it's almost just like having a partner in life. In yeah. General, just like marriage. And, and, it's, and it's, it's more so for us, in a sense, if you think you should do this alone, and everybody else should be just your employees. Right. You're missing out on a on an important component of how companies are being built. You also probably a lot of fulfillment that yeah. you get from your work, also. Yeah, and it, and it's and it's it's it, put aside. It's hard. It's you, you need you need this counterparty right. uh, to crown his shoulder and celebrate the success. And we always tell the CEOs exactly this. We tell them because it's such a hard journey, you really have to celebrate the successes. Celebrate the first PO. Take everybody, do barbecue at the beach. Right. When you sold ten thousand dollars. Right. Uh, when you have uh, ten employees, go and do a fun day, at whatever. Celebrate those small wins because they go by and you're busy and the yeah. hard life of being a. That's good life fan. advice in general. Yeah. Because life goes by so fast and you're yeah. caught up and in so much shit. That you're you absolutely and, and I mean you need to appreciate. Stop and smell the roses. You, so exactly. You need to appreciate those. Those happy moments, and we, frankly, we try to do this in stage one as well. Uh-huh. Um, just we, you know, we, again, we're a small team, but we think keeping up the team spirit and, and appreciating what everybody's putting in mm-hmm. to to the company uh-huh. uh, is crucially important. Right. We, we spend a lot of time on this as well. So when you're investing in companies, especially earlier stage, obviously the um, the time horizon is much more long term than other yeah. VCs that can come in later. Correct. Yeah. Um, how do you manage such long-term 
when you, like, how does that work exactly? How would that be different than a shorter term? Maybe if you can speak to a little bit about, about the patients when it comes to long-term VCs. Yeah. Also, um, the companies that you invest in, like most Israeli technology companies, they have longer sales cycles and things move slower. No, B2B absolutely. tech, in a sense. Um, how does that play a part into kind of the playing the long game. Yeah. And, and do your investors have patience for this? Are your investors usually younger, so they may have more pay? I'm just curious how that plays yeah. plays into the whole yeah, business. Yeah, there, there are a few components over there, and I'll try to reflect on, on all of them. Um, I, I once met uh, Scott Kapoor, uh, Kapoor from, from Andreessen, and uh, he, said, he said like a funny anecdote that I use a lot since. He said that the average marriage in the U.S. is about three and a half years, which is horrible from a perspective. He said the average startup in the U.S. is about seven years old. Uh-huh. So you're going to be spending more time like in, with your partners, or with your investment partners, and your board than you might be spending with your spouse. So this is, a, this is going to be a long-term relationship, and you need to choose well. Uh-huh. And, the, and the decisions you make early on, both for us, what type of entrepreneurs we invest in, and who do we want to do this right with, but also for them, are, are important. Now, you're absolutely right. We invest seed inception stage. Back in the days, people think, you know, starting a startup, that's going to be a fun ride. Maybe five years, we're going to have a great exit. Well, guess what? The big exits don't take five years. Right. And we're, we're you know, shooting for the fences. We, we want to bring in the billions, not the, the millions. Amen. And that, that takes time and that takes patience. And you're absolutely spot on. We need this patient all across the food chain for us. We need this patient from the entrepreneurs. Right. We need this patient from the team here. Right. We need the patient from the investors. Right. Because we all need to be aligned on that's going to be a seven, eight years. Now, we invest, um, we are very patient and very focused in our investment uh, thesis, and we try to raise a fund every four years. We now manage about half, half a billion dollars across those funds, and we've made you know, 58 investments. So we pace ourselves at the pace of about four investments a year just to give them the right attention and, and capacity. And when you think about this, the last companies we're going to be doing in, in a specific fund would have maybe five, six years in the fund life. And sometimes we need to extend the fund life, but we need to, we need to manage this. Uh, so typically uh, we would, you know, going back to those components, we'll talk to the founders and work with them on understanding this is going to be a long journey. Uh, happy for everyone uh, in the last few years, the, the whole concept of secondary and giving some liquidity has helped us help founders feel more financially secure. Right. Frankly, just maybe hitting a, a, a tough spot here, it's, it's a delicate balance between giving them uh, financial security to, on the other extreme, making them stinking rich don't want to work anymore because uh. um, this happened. I mean, we've seen in the high days of 2021, people doing secondary in companies and founders getting back you know, $10 million. Um, I'm sure that changes the motivation of you to go up and make a killing in the office every day. Right. Um, but we do work very closely with them on making sure they're happy and they brace for a longer duration and longer journey. And you really see the difference between entrepreneurs. There are those guys that say, no, I'm here, I'm here forever. Right. I'm going to build this amazing, great company. And if it takes another five years, uh-huh. we'll raise a little more money and we do it five years. And, and sometimes you see founders that realize at one point, not necessarily just because of them, also because of the company or because of the concept or because of the product or because of the market, they say, you know, maybe we're going to have a shorter run here. Maybe we need to. Maybe we need to get acquired right now, and this is also fine. And when you think about a typical fund, let's take a stage one, two, or stage one, one. In each one of them, we had seven, six exits. Um, How big were the funds? So, stage one, one before me was forty-six. That was a two thousand and one fund. Our twenty fourteen was sixty-five. Our twenty eighteen was one hundred and ten, and our uh, twenty uh, twenty-two was one hundred and fifty. Uh, but uh, when you look at, let's say, Fund 2, because I was involved in we had six exits. We had two large, very meaningful, like the 10x, returning almost the entire fund exits. 
we had uh, actually we had eight exits by now in this fund. Uh, we had um, we had uh, two exits in the mid range, uh -huh. three to five x, nice return, not the whole not the whole fund return, and then we had a few companies where we just returned the money, uh, which is also fine. I think uh, you know, getting any money back is great. Right. And uh, sometimes things don't work, and you want to be able to return money to your investors. And obviously, we had companies we had to shut down as well. Right. Yeah, but but at the end of the day, and that's you know, I'm obviously well known in our industry. The power law of VC says you need to have at least this one company that returns the entire fund to be able to generate meaningful return to your investors. And let's do the math. Um, let's say we invested the. Let's say we are a fifty million dollar fund, just to make the numbers a little rounder, and you had uh, you had five million dollar investment. Uh -huh. You need to do a ten x on this right. investment to return the fund. Right. Um, when you when you build in the ownership structure of how much you can own in those companies, this is a tough task, uh, and it's a tough task for us as a small smaller VC on the 100, 150 range. When you think about VCs the three hundred million dollar range, that's a very hard task. Right. Returning three x or two x on a fund like this is returning a billion, or right. Uh, returning a billion when you owe, when you typically own ten percent of those companies, means that you need to be involved in ten billion dollar in exits. Right. Well, guess what? Ten billion dollar in exits. That's a big number. Yeah, it's a big number. Yeah. So we uh, so that goes back to maybe tying everything back to where we started about the strategy. This is why we really like seed investments, because mm -hmm. for us as a relatively smaller fund, we can have meaningful ownership at earlier stages, and we can back those companies through the life cycle. And going back to your question about the duration, we will keep on investing in those companies in follow-on right. rounds to make sure that we protect our investment. Right. And then at exit, we can still have 10, 15, 20% of the companies, which is very meaningful. Uh, that's nice. Do you ever take, um, it's difficult to take some costs into account sometimes, you know, because now let's say with the, with like, uh, with the war and like to hear if you guys were affected at all. Yeah. Um, you know, how do VCs support companies that, um, there's two components, one with the war that might be struggling and wondering like at what point do you say maybe shut it down and like, you know, you say you want to continue to support them, then maybe it's just a sunk cost when do you cut your losses. Yeah. And then also, do you have to, since you continue to invest in the same company as you did a seed at further rounds, do you ever say that like, hey, maybe the change in technology, let's say with AI um, or competition or the landscape changes. So even if you, let's say the company had $50 million in investment, th throwing round numbers out there, yeah. um, then maybe now with technology and AI and LLMs that that gap that you've invested can be closed so quickly that is maybe not worth as much yeah. as you thought. How does that play into doing those following rounds? Yeah. So you have three, at least for me, three different questions. It's the yeah, war, yeah. it's the <laughs> sunk cost, and it's the change in technology. And I'll, the, I'll love let's to, start with the war, and then we'll go uh, into the more business Sure, I'd love, to, I'd love to answer all of them. So, so war, I, I mean, I think like everybody else in Israel, we've been in, impacted in so many different levels, on, on the personal level, on the, on the firm, on the portfolio, on the country. And, and we've been hurting since, and um, and it, it's been a very tough period. I mean, we in the team uh, have people that went to reserve duty for uh, for a long period of time. We had people on the team that have their kids in the army or in reserve duty. Uh, in the portfolio, we had about give or take about fifteen to twenty percent of the employees in our portfolio companies being impacted. Jeez. Uh, we had founders in reserve duties. I had calls with founders that insisted on having the calls when they're wearing their helmets and their gear, calling from whatever. Right. Um, so we, uh, and we, we, we've been, we've started with mapping the situation across a portfolio, and then moved to actions of how we can be helpful. And helpful is not necessarily always just funding. I mean, funding is, is easy and it's money and we gave money to companies where we, where we needed to help. But it's also making the right connections, helping them with service providers, talking to people that can help them. And, and we've, been, we've been spending a lot of time about this. At the end of the day, it, it really boils down to attention, just being out there for them, right. making sure that we, uh, we can support them. 
And then and the, I'll say on the national level, I mean, the team has been vol volunteering. We've been out, uh, we've been out helping both individual and as a team. And, um, and also, and I think not less important on the, say on the presence, on the social presence, on the network side, I mean, especially the, the more senior people here have many ties to people outside of Israel and being able to you know, tell our story, speak about what's going on here has been crucially important to our network, not necessarily just the investors, but our general network. So, mm -hmm. so this is the army, uh, this, is, this is the war, excuse me. Um, and the war has also had impact on companies that are being, you know, forcing to postpone their fundraising rounds and getting to a point where they're running low on, on cash. Um, we've been we've been trying to work very closely with those companies and basically bring every solution we can, either in our capacity or in the network that we have. Um, it's not been easy, uh, and we had uh, we had companies going through uh, again you know, minimal changes and reductions in force, uh, and it's it's not just the army; it's the it's the slowdown that has been around in twenty three. And uh, the, the the challenges in fundraising that started over there, and then with people saying, okay, we're going to delay this a bit, we're going to fundraise at the end of twenty three. Now they have the war, and and this is the this is a great impact, and and unfortunately we also see companies that are, that are shutting down or could end up being shut down, and it's, I'll say it's it's really heartbreaking for us. Um, it's a it's a it's a big challenge. And sometimes even what we and others can do are just not enough. Um, so so it's, it's unfortunate we, uh, you're talking about sunk costs in general, I mean, put aside the war and put aside yeah. the existing situation. Uh, you've all, my partner likes to say, the, the, you know, the most important decision for investor is where to put the money. Uh, the second most important is where not to put right. more money. And, um, and, uh, and, and it, it's something we spend a lot of time on, as you can assume, that's a huge friction point with our investors, with our with our founders. Yeah, because um, uh, nobody. Um, they feel like you're giving up on them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, we're trying to be very transparent in how we manage our investments to say, this is the roadmap of how we envision us investing in your company. We're going to be investing this amount now. Hopefully, this amount later, and that amount later. And if everything goes well, this is how we're going to continue investing in you in a general framework. Mm -hmm. We also typically tell them, if things are not going to work well, this is probably the next support we're going to give you to try to get the train back on the rails. But that's probably going to be our last check to you guys. Mm -hmm. So we would always give those guys a second chance. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Let's get this back together. Uh -huh. and let's resolve the situation. But it will typically come with the caveat of saying, this is likely going to be our last check. And we'll do everything we can to help you right. fundraise. But from our perspective, we cannot allow ourselves to do any more. I think most founders are super appreciative on the fact that we're A, being transparent to them and B, giving them the second chance. Right. And, um, and sometimes you need to realize that things are not working. Right. Yeah. And then for your last question about changes in technology, um, I think it's, um, or basically, you know, we invested today, things have changed, AI has evolved, LLMs, everything is now looking a little different. Um, I think, uh, in a sense, uh, startups or companies in general are almost like a, like a living organism where they need to adapt constantly to the situation they live in and the threats and the opportunities they have around them. And the best CEOs we have are those that can look, you know, over the next hill and try to understand what's going to happen in a year or two years from now, not necessarily what's happening tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And their ability to analyze both the challenges and the opportunities on the markets coming in is what really makes them great. Um, so uh, in the specific example you ask about AI, I think most of our CEOs were able to brace AI uh, and 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 add it to their capabilities and say, okay, now we're also like AI powered. Then we add this, and we haven't had companies where the sole product can be easily replaced by an AI. 
that would have been a failure in our decision making process of how do we create a technology barrier because uh, that would be very like a very low barrier to entry mm -hmm. uh, so so we haven't seen this but i mean ai in general has, has been such an interesting fascinating um, uh, storm coming into our life and um, and i think it's going it's to continue through I'm maybe I'm uh, naively optimistic. I think there are going to be more opportunities than challenges around this. I think also there is um, there is such a big ecosystem of different levels you can do around AI and different verticals and different type of AIs you can do that there's just room for so much innovation. And in a sense, for me, that reminds me of the of what happened when the cloud came in, uh, the cloud computing. And people were saying, you know, cloud computing, virtualization, Docker's, containers, Kubernetes. It all looked very strange and unfamiliar. And some people said, oh my God, that's going to be the end of on-prem computing. Well, guess what? No. You know, it's uh, maybe uh, people say it's between 15 and 20% in the larger corporations. Right. We still have radio, so. <laughs> no, no, it, it, but it, you're absolutely right. But I say cloud is just a huge, great industry with so much revenue and so many interesting companies and so many opportunities to grow and it's still just 20 percent and it still hasn't killed on-prem so ai is great and it's going to be i think as meaningful as cloud uh, but it's not going to kill everything else that's my take awesome great um Tal, thank you so much for joining us on israel sure. tech if people want to stay up to date with uh, stage one and you will put everything down in the description uh, so they can follow us and uh, make sure to hit like and subscribe on Israel Tech here on YouTube and on your social media channels. Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for, for having work. me. Take care.